Hey, Mad Audience. My name is Kenneth Wynn, and I'm guest hosting for Tuan for the next few episodes. We're still going to be touching on marketing, art, and design. I mean, what isn't related to these things, right? But I'll be zooming out just a little bit to talk about uh, Vietnamese people around the world, get to know their story beyond their career, as with previous episodes. Um, a little bit about me. I live in Los Angeles with my wife and two kids. I have a brother who lives in Vietnam for almost two decades now, and he gives me uh, a reason to come to Vietnam to visit two to three times a year. I've worked in several industries that include interior design, manufacturing, food and beverage, film, and most recently, podcast hosting. Thank you, Nest Cafe, for sponsoring this episode. Thử mưu tượng bạn đang cầm một tách cà phê ấm nóng, nhẹ nâng lên như nâng niu cả thiên nhiên hiền hòa. Hít một hơi thơm lừng cho ưu phiền tan theo dịp thở. Hey everyone, uh, my name is Hoa Bui. Um, I am the technical product manager at Riot Games. Um, I work on the skins production team, um, specifically on the technology team that kind of helps uh, the production team kind of make the, uh, the skins content for League of Legends. What does it mean to be Vietnamese to you? Oh man, that's such a broad question. <laughs> it means uh, being proud of everything that you are. And, and that defines, you know, what it means to be like a, a Vietnamese person. Everything from the physicality of who you are, your skin color, your tone, to uh, you know your language, your behavior, and also living with some of the historical context of our uh, of our, you know, country, um, and navigating that. And, you know, we'll never get away from that. Um, that's part of who we are. So yeah, all that. That's what it means to be Vietnamese. When you arrived in the U.S. and you thought about like. As you were growing up, what did you think that you wanted to do? I remember when I was young, I wanted to be a sorcerer, but you know that wasn't real, so you know you couldn't really do that. So I tried the next. So I thought maybe I should be a magician. <laughs> but wait, wait, where did you get that idea of being a sorcerer? And then when did you find out that you could not be a sorcerer? I think it was like realizing that that was fictitious at some point in my young youthful life. <laughs> I can't cast spells. What the hell? So then you wanted to get into uh, what did you say after sorcerer? A magician. A magician. This is like uh, yeah, this is like an elementary school. Yeah, I think part of the theme was I just like magic, and, like some fantasy, and so video games was always like a a, a way into that. Because um, I think uh, when I was a kid, like you know, life was school and study and family. So and then so you know I couldn't really go outside because we were also living in you know we're poor so we lived in a lot of dangerous areas so going outside was a big no no so all I had was inside and my imagination so like playing video games living in fantasies using my computer a lot that, that was kind of like I I think a lot of the driving factors for like why I kind of took the path I did yeah when you um, think about um, magic how does it apply to you know what you do now. I don't think it's magical, but I feel like people outside think it's pretty magical. Like I, I do. Like, That's why I asked that question. I think it's very magical. <laughs> and I, I put mean, you in a, I put you in Go a ahead. non generous uh, question mode. I, I kind of forced you to think the way, and I just noticed that. I was like, wait, that's probably not how he thinks, but I think of it as very magical. No worries, because like um, it, you know, it's it, it's like it is kind of magical in a lot of ways, like it, how. You know, like when I think about like, hey, how vaccines are made. Now I'm like, oh, it just seems pretty magical. I'm sure someone can walk me you through and like figure it out. And on the game side, you know, as you ask the question, I'm like, actually, it is kind of complicated. I'm like, if I had to do it myself at the scale, and I was like, mm. <laughs> it's yeah. a lot to think through. Uh, I think part of what is magical about it is that like um, video uh, video games. You know, it, there's an emotion. There's a strong emotional component. You don't play video games because there's some logical reason of like how this improves your life you play because you're trying to relax you're, you're you feel good about it and stuff like that and so I, i think like when you talk about magic i think that's why people play video games there is some magic some thing that can't be explained that it kind of provide, adds to your life when i was growing up i uh there were clearly two camps of kids that uh, that i i remember now um there are camps and there was overwhelming majority that like to play video games And there was a minority few that, like me, uh, did not want to play video games. I just felt like I was wasting my life away. And I didn't need my parents to say, you can't play, because I was one of those kids that were just self-centered. Not, I would try not to play as much as, like, say, my brother. But now that I look back, I wanted, and I want to ask you today, did you play? 
And did you ever feel like you were, I don't want to say wasting away time, but did you ever think about like, is this something that you felt guilty for participating in? Um, I never felt guilty. Um, but um, my parents were always like, mm. <laughs> I think like part of it for me was that I always got my homework done. Like I never did the intersectionality of it. Like it was video game a career. I just knew that I just had to study, do my thing. And if I finished studying, I could play my games and have fun. When I started thinking about my career, like what I wanted to do, um, I remember taking a programming class in college and making a game like, oh, maybe, maybe this is a career. Maybe I can do this. And as I got uh, closer to college um, and applying to different colleges and everything, I knew, you know, I was applying to like all the normal Asian colleges, every Asian parent wants to go, all the UCs and stuff like that. I, I actually didn't get into any of those. And so uh, when I was like, well, there's this art school that teaches you how to make video games in San Francisco. I was like, maybe I'll try that. And I took some, I went to their like, um, their introduction and everything. I was like, oh, this is what I want to do. I want to make video games. Um, I was also very self-aware of what I'm good at, what I'm not good at. Um, and so I was like, I think this is something I could be good at. Um, and so I kind of just like went heads in. And surprisingly enough, my parents were supportive, uh, which is very rare for Asian parents to be, because not only was this an art school, they thought I went in for art. Um, actually, it was a programming degree. And I think for what kind of really helped them get through it was a lot of my uncles were very progressive. We had most, a lot of my uh, uh, extended family is in tech. And so video games in a lot of ways was in tech. And mm. um, like, I even remember a conversation with my dad one day. I don't think he heard me, but I was like in the background, like he was just like, oh God, Jesus. You know, maybe if he gets into video games and he just makes one good video game, he'll be fine for the rest of his life, right? That's all he really needs. Yeah. <laughs> that, it's so weird that that's not even how it works, right? You yourself can't just make one video game, right? It's like, there's like, thousands of people that are involved in this. And I want to get into that too. Um, but what was the conversation like with, with your mom and dad? Uh, hey, mom and dad, I'm going to go to art school. And I mean, you left the the, the, the programming conversation out of it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, I was like, I want, I want to try this school. I've already applied to all the other schools. And so like, so we, we, sat, we actually went through the orientation together and looked at everything. And my uncles did it with me too. And I think they got feedback. And they just never, they never questioned it, um, like openly, at least. Um, they were just kind of like, okay. My mom, actually, my mom was more vocal. She was like always worried all the time. I would say I'm a terrible artist. And one of the early classes, even though I went for a software development degree, I had to draw a lot and I had never really drawn before. And you could, if you're looking at early stuff, it's terrible. Um, and, but I practiced and I tried very hard and my drawing got a lot better. Um, and I think that's kind of helped instill a lot of confidence in them um, that like, you know, perseverance and hard work, you can kind of overcome a lot of things. So then you graduate the school and what's the first job you get out of school? So uh, my first job uh, out of school was an internship at Disney. It's not an inter it was a it was associate position at Disney. I was so happy. Um, within two months, I got fired. <laughs> what happened? I think for me, I didn't know. Uh, I was adjusting to you know, working in a corporate environment. I just didn't know what it was like. I also have a slight like laziness streak sometimes that happens. And I think that that kind of came through in that. And so um, so that was kind of why I was kind of fired. And my parents were like very devastated. I was pretty devastated too. Did you um, see it coming? Somewhat. I wish, I mean, I was young and stupid. What do I know? Yeah. <laughs> and then this is kind of like, it's kind of, uh, you know, they would give you feedback, but, you know, it was like, what do you do about it? How do you grow? How do you adjust? What do you, you know, how do you, how do you navigate all these things? I was so young and foolish. I didn't know what to do. I am lucky that like uh, the ironic thing was a different Disney division uh, uh, hired me. Um, and I had to explain this to the, <laughs> the people hired them. It was so awkward. And then they confirmed it was a lower level position, but like, I'm very thankful for that, that they allowed me. Um, cause it allowed me to kind of start my career over a little bit. Can I ask you what you got fired for? Or is it just a gradual thing? Uh, I, it wasn't like a thing I did. It was just like, I think it was just, I wasn't, uh, producing the work output they wanted. Yeah. That kind of happened to me when I was younger too. Yeah. I, I completely understand. And, and it's weird because we're just blindsided by like what we have no self-awareness that 
I was 17, 18, I was in the Marines and same thing happened to me. I, it was just like a few times they would sit me in the chair and they're like, yo, you're going to get kicked out of here if you don't straighten up. And I'm thinking to myself, like, what, why, what's the big deal? You know, what, what am I doing wrong? And I couldn't figure, you know, when you're in that for a few years, you can't really figure it out until much later you start to, oh my God, this is how the ant colony works, right? Mm -hmm. You at Disney, I very quickly learned I am a cog in the wheel and I need to cog, keep spinning my cogs. <laughs> <laughs> and then, so how long were you at Disney for? Um, let's see. So after Disney feature animation was like two, three months. Uh, and then after that, I went to this, uh, the smaller studio. Uh, they only, it doesn't exist anymore. It was, um, it's called Image Movers Digital. And it was like Robert Zemeckis's like uh, animation studio who briefly um, created with Disney. And that was like for, I think, eight, eight nine months um and i left because i couldn't stand the work uh the work schedule anymore wow uh robert zemeckis did he was that before or after he did polar express right after because that movie is like kind of kicked it off and so um yeah and so he's like oh, okay i can i can make animations now <laughs> yeah, my, my brother was the uh motion one of the motion capture guys on the polar express he worked uh yeah in the early years he out of also out of your school but the santa monica branch uh he got a job in motion capture for a few years with with those guys and they work closely with the uh, zemeckis and uh, the polar express oh that's freaking awesome small world you know it's a small world but you don't here's the thing i never hear about other vietnamese people you know even though i live in this town i don't hear of other vietnamese people that are in these um very cool interesting niches and and the way i look at it is like if i get to talk to you today about what you do and other kids are out there we just need one or two other kids to hear this and go okay that is a position that's possible and i want to hear how he got from where he got you know to where he is today slogging through the vietnamese culture because mom and dad are like no i can't you know you can't do this or whatever you know just <laughs> If these young people can see one person doing it, that's all that matters to me, right? Like uh, representation. That's why representation matters in a lot of in a lot of ways. It's like you you could imagine yourself being this thing, and that kind of motivates you to become whatever it is you need to be. So then you you leave Sony. I mean, you leave Disney, and then what where do you go after that? So after Image Movers Digital, I worked at, um, I worked at Lucasfilm Animation for about three years, um, working on Clone Wars, um, the sort of the animated series. Um, one of the best projects of my life. Uh, I got to work at uh, um, uh, near um, at the Lucas Ranch, and so oh. I, yeah, and so you can see how bougie George Lucas can be. <laughs> you know, you got you got your your Wagyu bulls to your left, your Olive Garden to your right, and then a, a vineyard over here. It's just 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 because you can have a vineyard. <laughs> three three years of that, and it was fantastic. I loved it. Yeah. I learned a lot and um, I, uh, I, I, I think this is where I actually made up for all my uh, mistakes in my previous careers and I've worked very hard. Um, I think this is where I, I, I definitely felt um, one of my first strides. Okay, so let's talk about that. Three years, what do you do there and what are you brought on to do? Um, at first I was brought on to just like literally check files and make sure they're clean and, and not dirty. And uh, I don't know anything about 3D production, but we deal with a lot of like technical files. And so you kind of have to weed, weed through them and figure out what's going on. Um, so I wasn't even making the, uh, the, uh, the images in themselves. That was like done by our external partners. And like, um, so we had an office in Singapore, uh, Lucasfilms uh, Singapore. Um, so we worked with them a lot. And um, so I was brought on to clean all these files, do all these things. And over time, I was like, you know, there's better ways to do these things. So I, so I was a software developer. So I started writing a lot of tools to kind of fix all this stuff. Um, and, then, and then so they just slowly gave me more responsibilities over time. Um, and uh, I started getting flown over to our, our regional offices to help them um, mature and figure out better ways to improve themselves. And this is getting data basically organized and moved from place to place. Yeah, yeah. And then in those three years, I mean, at what point do you go, okay, I've had enough of this. I am going to look for another position in the business. I'll be frank. It was mostly money driven. Working in the film industry, people, I think uh, any, any industry where it's driven by passion, you will find a lot of opportunities 
to underpay people a little bit so because they are passionate about things and you know the game industry is similar in some ways too but um that was a lot of reason why so i um, i decided to find a new job even though like you know the work itself was rather rewarding for me um i uh, i interviewed at uh, pixar canada uh, in vancouver and left for a year and a half and worked over there doing the same work uh doing different work I was focused on uh, before I was focused on uh, dealing with art files and making them. Um, now I was dealing with actually uh, drawing of the images. So like the things you would see in, in screen. Uh, you, you worked as an artist. No, I was more like um, so the way computer uh, a, an image is drawn for like an image is uh, computers draw an image. And in order for it to draw an image, it needs a lot of art files and code that needs to be run so they can draw the image. And oftentimes the image doesn't draw properly. You'll see like lines or black areas or stuff like that. So I, 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 I as someone technical, have to go in and figure out like, why is this thing drawing this way? <laughs> Something that I would never think that you need to do. You, right? You, you, you need to clean up the images that you, when you're putting all this together, you, have, you need somebody to kind of put it together. You just can't like throw a bunch of things together and, and expect it to an artist to put it together. Yeah. Like, and it's, it's funny. Cause like, I take a lot of pride in my work. So Pixar films are usually very pristine. So is Disney. Like they, they really care about the details. I was actually watch uh, my, my DreamWorks friend is going to hate me for this. I watched uh, how to train your dragon. Wonderful movie. Great story. Like fantastic. It was so rushed. I could tell because I was watching it and wow. there was a shot where there was like they, they they showed a rock in the background and it was like very clear and then they cut away they cut back and the rock is now blurry but no one notices it but i see it <laughs> i'm like what the fudge what happened to this rock <laughs> and i was like oh i, I would have fixed this if it was me but whatever this movie's wonderful no one care no no one cares about this blurry rock <laughs> it, okay so you're like five or six years into the industry right it seems like there's a lot of different paths that you can take um in terms of like this sort of digital sort of uh visual uh medium technical there's so much going on here how do you pick a path i mean or does the path pick you i think it's both you can make both work the industry is mature enough especially in film that like you could be a very specific cog and you could just define yourself and that's it and then you would you move up have a successful career probably make a decent amount of money and, and have a family and you'll be fine um, I think there are a lot of opportunities to kind of figure out your own path. You're, as yeah. you're probably hearing me describe, I deal with a lot of different things. I deal with art. I deal with technical things. I deal with like um, production management and stuff like that too. So like, and there's definitely opportunities for those too. Um, and I think that like, it's just because of the nature of the industry and it's evolving. Like my skills, they're just, they're not like film production skills in any particular way. It's just 3D development. And when I think about 3D development, I think like, well, where else is there? There's video games, there's VR, there's AR, um, there's web. So there's still a lot of different applications to it. You kind of just have to, like, if you took the broad step, you kind of have to access, hey, what do I know? What do I, what, what can I do now? And what are the opportunities and jobs out there? And how do I either adjust my skill set or change how I represent myself and stuff like that? That sounds very messy. It is very messy, but that's like, that's kind of the, that's like the fun you know, of that's, it. That's the career, though, right? That's like you know they're like I think you're uh, I think you know really successful people they're they're able to deal with ambiguity. They're able to kind of like they have a great sense of self awareness of who they are, what they are, and what they can do, and they also have a great sense of awareness of the things around them that towards whatever they want, and it just comes down to first getting that awareness and then figuring out like the thing that the tactical things you need to do to get there yeah and i think a lot of people struggle with that yeah like, it doesn't like seem, it's, if it's not a clear path yeah like it college. doesn't seem like a clear path i mean you seem like a really young man and you it seems like you have another 30 years on your your flight path and it's just like where you could go to a lot of different this road can lead you to very different career paths right mm -hmm. so what was next after that what when you left uh, pixar canada uh, when I left, uh, I went to Riot. And the funny thing was like, uh, 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 I had interned at EA when I was in college. And I've also like used to live in LA a little bit when I was young too. 
And I vowed, I don't want to live in LA ever because I hate the traffic. And two, I don't ever want to return to video games because I don't like the work schedule. <laughs> wow. And funny enough, Riot <laughs> was both of those. And then I was just like, but they they convinced me. They convinced me. <laughs> um, it was such a uh, it was such a great opportunity for me because like um, they they promised a lot of different things that like what like was against what normal game development was. It was um, they believed in work life balance. They believed in the dream of being a gamer. You know, you can work for a company and make games, but this is company making games. Or are they making products so they can make money? And that's kind of the difference in mentality of different companies. And with Riot, like, you know, every day I get told, we're a game that makes games for players and we want you to think like a player. And and that manifests in a lot of the fabric of our company. And that's why I love working for this company. I get to be a gamer. I looked at their website and um, you know, I looked at the website because I was researching uh, you and I saw that there's a, a different kind of social consciousness that's happening on, uh, you know, on, on a very sur surface level. And I and, and it sounds like it's permeating, permeating through the culture of, of the, the people that work there. I thought it was all a facade, but now I'm like, wow, I'm, I'm very impressed by this. I'm, I'm glad, man. I'm glad. Because you like, don't hear film companies doing that. Film companies do not do that. Um, and then a film companies should be doing that because they are t telling stories that are dealing with real life and great lessons and, you know, wonderful things about humanity. And they should be the... But then I was like so surprised to read these things about a gaming company. I, I know nothing about the, the gaming industry, but I was like, oh, I wonder if they're all like that. No, no, game companies, they it's uh you know like I, I don't know if you read up but game the game industry has such a bad rap you know it just it it choose pe it brings people in and chews people out and that's just been ongoing for so many years um, um i think i'm we're lucky now that like <clears throat> tech has kind of changed the landscape of video game industry um and kind of influenced a lot because there's a higher standard of expectation of how you treat your employees and i think that's a good thing yeah, they even had like a little post on um, how uh, they're involved with the um, AAPI community. I was like, whoa, this is crazy for a company to be this socially conscious, you know, um, a video game company of all companies. And you know, the funny thing is a lot of that is driven by individuals, just people who cared. You know, and, and I think one of the wonderful things, right, is like if you care enough, things can happen. Like I, I think a lot of in a lot of ways, like a lot of our involvement with a lot of communities is just because that we had a random writer who just really believed in it enough and made something happen on our side. Because I sort of know, you know, I've known you through the a pre-interview call and we've talked about this before. But um, you know, this is not something that I, I typically talk about, but I think it's it's uh it's an interesting point because I think you've asked me to, you know, we're we've talked about this uh, talking about this subject. And it even makes me tap dance a little bit to even bring up the subject. But you're a gay man. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, being a gay man and, and being married, I, I want to know your journey. <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to know your journey through this. What I feel is a very, uh, could be a bro y, techy, tech bro y industry and field. And as you were coming up, like, what was that journey like for, for you, a Vietnamese gay man? Growing up, I never really thought I was gay, um, but there were a lot of things I felt that I think would have, if I if I knew better, I would have known. Um, and I think that just comes from our culture kind of teaching uh, us, like you know, being gay is wrong. And so you, there is a strong pressure to be to not be that, even if your behaviors, your your want, everything that you are tells you either that i think when i was like 22 23 when i started uh to realize it um what happened was i uh i met a guy and i had fallen in love for the first time in my life i'm like oh my god this is love i was like i know oh, this wow. feeling this this feeling is love and i'm like oh my god and i love this guy and and then that really pushed me over to saying for sure i am gay wow and up to that point you never felt that I was always, I was like dating girls and wondering why, like, it's just like, well, where's this feeling of connection I'm missing, you know, and just not understanding why I, I had a hard time kind of having relation, uh, building a relationship with uh, 
with, you know, a, a romantic relationship with women and stuff like that. Like my life started making more sense. Mm. Everything, everything, all the, all the boxes start fill, being filled in. I was like, oh my God, this is it. Cause I can imagine like being in the entertainment industry on the film side is not, um, the growth of, 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 a, of somebody, of an employee in a company is not, uh, not that bad if, you know, it's the treatment is not probably not that bad if you're a gay man, but on the gaming side, like what was that journey or what has that journey been like for you? I think gaming has always been progressive. Like gaming is always, because you have a bunch of nerds on the internet and the internet is very progressive, but the interaction doesn't, it doesn't always like come off well. Cause like I'm from a different culture. I think for me, my experience at Riot, I don't feel that. Um, but I do know, uh, I know people in the industry that do feel that way. Uh, I think mostly because like I'm in art and art is a very feels based group. Like I, and you have a lot of people who, you know, who, who, you know, we talk a lot about our feelings because it's art because you're in that environment, you talk more about other people and the interactions. There's a lot more compassion and uh, compassion and welcoming than this to the conversations and how we treat each other. Absolutely. Now, uh, in terms of like the growth from the family side, uh, how did you, uh, did your mom and dad know, did they have any inkling that this was who you are? I think people have always thought I was an odd person. People are always trying to help me, um, trying to figure out because they they think that there's something wrong with me. I, and I think that's like the Asian mentality, right? We're not we're not going to talk to each other about our feelings. I'm not going to try to understand who you are, but I'm going to project and guess a lot of what's wrong about you, and then try to work work around you and try to fix you from behind the scenes. <laughs> so ridiculous! I'm so glad we're talking about this. Wow, <laughs> it's so true. It's like they're attacking problems that are not there. It's so, and it's funny because it's a, it's so endemic to our culture. How how did uh, your your mom and dad specifically uh, evolve throughout the years um, up until the day you got married? I mean, how how did that? What's the story behind that? One of the things I I kind of inherently believe that they always loved me first. And I think when you start there, everything else just becomes uh, just who they are that you kind of have to work through, if that makes mm, sense. That makes perfect sense. And so with that, you know, all the disagreements, the shock and everything, that's just a process of acceptance. And uh, I would say that like my brother helped a lot with the acceptance because he, you know, he's very bro -y, but he still accepted first even though he still makes gay jokes all the time, which, you know, whatever. <laughs> which brother, your younger or older brother? My younger brother, just all the time, all the time. It's like, he always loves a joke about how, like, I, I you know, I, I made, you know, the way I told him was that, like, hey, can we, I want to have, I need, we need to have lunch. And I never asked him for lunch. And he, um, he had to drive two hours from Davis to go have lunch with me. And he said, oh, shit, you know, he must be dying or something. It must be cancer. <laughs> and he was, I was just like, yeah, I'm gay. He was like, what? That was it? You made me two hours for this? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, what is important to me? I didn't know how you were reacting. But did he, I, did he know? Did he know be from before or no? No. No, he didn't know. I mean, I didn't even know, but... Um, but I think a lot of things made more sense for him. Like, you know, M Mariah Carey CDs and love my love for Celine Dion, you know, that, that stuff started becoming more clear. <laughs> Let's get back to games. And um, I want to know what sort of, um, what's the cycle of a creation of a game? Like I have an idea for a game and you know, how does it go from, I have an idea to this is like now a multi-billion dollar IP. I see. You want to make a successful game. <laughs> <laughs> I don't care. I, it's just, I, I want to get my idea. I, I'm using it as an example. I have no interest in getting a game out made. But how does it start? Like, who comes up with the, the idea of the story or the inkling, the seed of the seedling of this uh, concept? I think like a lot of it starts in like most ideation rooms. It's just like, you know, you come together and you think about like what's fun. Um, so you kind of... Um, so most production processes, you go through a couple of different phases. You go through this, uh, uh, brainstorming or discovery, which is like, hey, I'm just trying to figure out what we want to do. So there's nothing built yet. You just kind of figure out your idea. Um, and then the second phase you go through is uh, called pre-production, which is start, you start flushing out, answering your, your, more, uh, your tactical questions that you may run into. Like, hey, how, what would be the general approach we would take to kind of make this game? And then uh, the third phase is production, where you actually make the thing, 
and and then the final phase is like probably like clean up and you know release and the distribution to or, or um, a di different partners around the world depend depending how do how does a game company know if a game is going to do well someone said this really well they're like you know you can give me all the money in the world and i can't ever guarantee you that a game is going to do well wow it's like a film i think what makes uh, games a little harder than film is that I think with film, at least you can get a storyboard and you kind of generally know a story and you know what's going to happen because you can follow through. Um, uh, how I know this, I saw the storyboard for up, to, you know, the first 10 minutes of up with just uh, the temporary music and then someone flipping the storyboard pages and I cried. That's how, that's how good a storyboard is. <laughs> wow. And if and, you can build on that, you, you have a product. Yes, yes. But with games, it's so much harder because like you you don't have that storyboard really. There's a lot more components to it. Um, it's not a passive activity for the user because you're just sitting there and observing and feeling things. It's an active participation. So there's a lot more like things you need to do and um, and more there's a yeah, there's more things you need to do and more things you need to consider. Like things will feel weird if you 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 don't um, you don't refine it properly, and so that it makes the complication of developing it and making sure the things feel right much harder. It sounds like millions and millions of dollars to get that feel and get that experience right. That's mm -hmm. a big gamble. I mean, for a typical game company like Riot, how many games do you have in development at at a? I mean, if it's proprietary, you know, you don't have to answer. But typically, I mean, you have is it like a dozen projects going on or hundreds at the very small development level or stage? And then does it become, you know, it gets narrowed down as you go up the pyramid or how does it work? Um, I think that like, uh, I can't speak specifically about Riot, uh, but I think in general, uh, bigger game companies like Activision and Blizzard, I'm so sure they always have some R&D division kind of proving out ideas and next things they want to do. Um, that's just normal. I think smaller studios, it is harder because um, you know it is a huge upfront investment to do anything. Um, so I think they're like in smaller studios, they're usually just kind of like flying on the seat of their pants. Like after I do this, I'm gonna have, I like, generate another idea and hopefully it goes well or something like that. Um, yeah, and I think that's just how the industry kind of works. This idea of um, the economics of creating a game and getting it out to market and all of that. I mean, uh, you can bankrupt a company if you put out a product after all of that R&D and all of that development. I mean, it could, it could really go belly up if it doesn't perform well, right? Yes. And I, that's definitely happened with a lot of companies like uh, PS3 era. Um, there was a game called Lair. Um, and it was like a, a dragon flying around shooting, you know, shooting fire. You know, on concept, you're like, oh, that's cool. You know, I'll fly a dragon, shoot things, kill things end up doing terrible on the PS3. Actually took down the whole company because um, it's the level of investment they have to do with it. Um, it's it's like making a game is one of the most complicated things you can do in software engineering and uh, and making it feel fun at the same time is even harder. So yeah, it's, it's definitely like heavy, heavy investment and it will, can take down your studio. Did you play Lair? Yes. Did you understand and see why that that it failed yeah what, yeah, what was, was the reason i think for me it was um it wasn't fun and it felt like um it felt more like a tech demo than it was a game you know one of the funny things about the game industry is that like um i think for a certain period of time uh it was like the it was the performance wars my 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 console is better than your console because it runs x amount faster and you know things like that and i think that like um one of the first people to kind of recognize that's a fails that's a failing strategy because what you ended up doing was you could sell your consoles at loss and hopefully you make it up for it with your successful games that you were gambling on and that was like very that was like a difficult business proposition so um for Nintendo, one of the I think one of the best game companies out there, they were like, we're just gonna make fun games, and uh, we're gonna focus on what we do, which is very fun, and we're gonna and try to do that the best we can, and people will probably buy into it, and I think that's worked out for them very well, because like I will buy a, a Mario game 
just because you know even though it's slightly it's pretty much the same game it's slightly different it's a fun game mario karts was like i it was, that was like the only game i played because it was fun yeah and it's a very simple comic you t- take a cart you play it with your friends and you go around that the mechanic hasn't even changed that much over the years you're still buying it i buy like every copy <laughs> But then now there's like all these add-ons and stuff that you can do to uh, that lives within the online sort of virtual marketplace of buying equipment and armor. That that has to be a, a component to every game now, right? Yeah, because I think that's like uh, like you're talking about the DLCs, like downloading things and buying more. Oh, um, I'm assuming you're like, hey, after I buy a product, there's other things you're trying to sell me. Yeah. <clears throat> I think that comes from trying to make a more sustainable business model. I think that like one of the big challenges of the old, like um, the, I would call it the console model where you're like, hey, this is a $60 game, right? So part of the challenge of the business proposition is that like, hey, in order for me to make a $60 game, I first have to invest, let's say $200, $200 million minimum just to make the game, right? Now I got to distribute to everyone. So you got to buy all these discs, get to everyone's, you know, hands and everything. And, and it's $60, which is not a small investment. So if you're a consumer, you're, you're probably like picking and choosing which game game you wanted to buy. And so not only was that investment big, you, you, you had to be the best, otherwise you wouldn't be making money. Um, And so that was like a very, like a very difficult position for console games to be in. Yeah. And it's a one and done, right? Yeah, it's one done. So that's why, like, I think, like, um, <clears throat> like when there's different ways. To, there's DLC why you download something else, you pay. There's subscriptions where you subscribe to things, and there's the gift boxes. Um, all those things are just trying to extend the uh, either a make recoup your money or extend the life of the game itself, so that like you you didn't just spend this two hundred million dollars and just got sixty sixty dollar like whatever people paid. You're like trying to get more out of it, um, which you know feels bad for for people like i think like i think there is something to be said where it just feels like the gaming industry is trying to nickel and dime you um a little bit um and i get that perspective at least i think the industry is evolving to figure out better ways to approach those situations a lot of people who do care and want like a better experience for their users and people feeling like when they buy something it's rewarding like you're not just being nickel and dime what is your exact day-to-day look like like what do you do at riot at the simplest level i'm a producer for a tech company uh, tech uh, team and so my day to day is a lot of meetings um so i have to i have a very active calendar and i have to keep my calendar up to date i also yeah. have work i need to do like you know just uh documents at the fill or things that have to kind of uh uh, uh roadmaps have to make and stuff like that um and so i have to carve out time for myself to do work for that too and so everything every hour every minute of my day is accounted for (laughs) you go back to vietnam you said quite a bit in the last few years uh when is the last time you've been back and what's it been like for you the last time i was back was when wing went back and he had to cut its ship short so that was what like march last year and then before that actually the year before that uh, i was there a lot because uh um we're uh, doing some work over there and so i was there like back and forth a lot um but i love Vietnam I, I think it's a very familiar place to me now it's just like I don't feel like a foreigner in there anymore what about gaming and tech how is that uh, developing in Vietnam uh, I have a very naive understanding of it uh, mainly because like I just don't know enough but I have interacted with a couple of companies and talked to various people over there I uh, I think that like um, it is maturing for sure it's getting a lot better and then I think part of that is that like our schools and universities and training programs have gotten a lot better. So and it shows in the, the skills of the people that are coming up. The infrastructure and the uh, incentives to kind of evolve the industry needs to improve so that like that can further grow. Because I think that like if like Vietnam can like if Vietnam wants to grow its technology arm, um, it needs to do a lot more like like one of the big my big gripes is the internet sucks in vietnam it is atrocious what does vietnam need to do as a whole to get their tech and gaming industries up better investments in um uh well the education the infrastructure 
uh, and more partnerships with uh, exter external um, companies that like just do it better. So like, uh, I think it's, my favorite is Singapore, uh, how they kind of, uh, they're like, hey, you know, we don't have many resources. So we have to figure out different ways to kind of grow our like a working class. Like they have to go into businesses that like can sustain without real resources. So they go in law thought and um, tech, obviously. Um, the way they kind of dealt with that was that like, um, uh, they do uh, they do training programs where like hey um, use this as a hub like but a certain amount of your people have to be our uh, have to be Singaporean you have to train them up um, also they they pair a lot with uh, different companies to have Singaporeans fly over and do training over mm -hmm. there too wow. so they do insane amount of incentives to kind of like grow the uh, the skills uh, the the the, um, the skill sets of their like uh, of the working class. I mean, it, it sounds like you're very passionate and you, you're very happy uh, in the game industry. But if there was another profession, what would, would you, what would you be doing? I thought about going the nonprofit route. I very much care about, uh, uh, well, two things. I care about in, uh, education and um, community. Um, I've also thought about uh, uh, joining um doing more uh, virtual reality um because that's getting interesting um it's still very young and mature uh, immature sorry um but you know it, it's working its way yeah that vr world is uh very interesting there was a guest that i had early on um he runs a vr he's been in vr for for many years and uh the work that that that's happening on that side of it it's so interesting um, the possibilities uh, for gaming, for films, for music, for all sorts of uh, digital entertainment. Yeah, yeah, it's so crazy because like uh, you can watch a sports game in VR and feel and feel the um, feel like you're there because it there's a there's a feeling of depth to it now. You can actually create depth, and and then there are interactive UIs that are floating around telling you what's going on. I'm like, this is so surreal. Wow, and this is live? Are you or is it like a, a pre-recorded game? Because like we can detect, like you can construct a live three D environment now, with just with with like a, if you set your cameras right and everything, you can construct a live three D environment. So when is that technology going to be permeating uh, to the general public? Um, I think there are some applications for it. I think it's just expensive because like you know. Like first, you have to get people to buy a VR set. Yeah, and then and then you gotta get people to learn how to use this damn thing. And mm -hmm. it is it is it is not like using a cell phone. <laughs> 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 I think there's a lot of cool things we can do, but there hasn't been that thing that uh, really draw that really like makes VR explode. Um, and until that happens, it's gonna be hard to kind of see VR as like a, a general public thing. You know, I'm glad we're we're sort of on the tail end of our conversation and we're sort of um, in this VR zone because um, my hope uh, with all of the guests uh, eventually is to make mini panels. It would be fun to to hear about, you know, from a technical, from an art perspective um, and all Vietnamese guys and, and gals that can come on and, and give like a mini panel and uh, we can come up with some questions and you know, really explore the future of uh, digital entertainment for uh, as it relates to VR. That's awesome. Yeah, that'd be fun. Yeah, I, mean, um, I, I have a lot of opinions. So <laughs> we welcome that. Well, you know what the best thing is, is when uh, you got three, four uh, people and they fight each other because they want to just like give their opinions. You know, that's the best I information that's going back and forth. That, <laughs> I want to see You're people wrong. fight. Fuck you, bro. Yeah. <laughs> I want to see oh, people I, fight. No, I'm, my unpopular opinion is, is these fucking Google VR headsets. They make the phones. Fucking hate them. They're garbage. Wait, why? <laughs> you mean the quality is garbage or? Yeah, the quality is garbage. The It's just half assed Like, yeah, you can kind of do it. But it's like, it's, it's, it's not a like over fine experience it's are you saying in, in in contrast to like an oculus uh like headset yeah okay yeah. so google oakley looking uh glasses yeah. versus uh the the complete like uh aviator no. like flight no, 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 it was, 
no no it was like you remember the google like uh, it was you had a you had a box you build and you put your phone in there and then you put the thing in and yeah. then that's how you looked at it and i was like really this is how you're gonna do the vr i was like this is awful and i used it and, I was, and it was just so clunky and the experience didn't feel right it just felt like a tech demo yeah. And I think that, you know, you put a flat screen in front of you. There's no ways like the ratios of like the degrees and the angles of light bending and stuff like that is going to create some sort of reality that you're trying to work in, walk into. Yeah. It, it sounds like a, a real bad shortcut. Um, I'm curious to see if AR more evolve because I think that's more practical. Um, so we'll see when the, when the, the, uh, the, I think that, I think there will be a like like a hit in AR before there'll be a hit in VR. Hot, thank you so much uh, for your time today. It went by very quick, and um, I am going to put this mini panel together, and we're going to have you back on very soon. It was great uh, chatting, and like I um, and thanks for all the awesome questions. That was very. <laughs> I was like, oh my god, these are really deep questions. <laughs> So deep, you call me Confucius at one point. <laughs> Thanks again, Hua. No worries. Anything. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, friend. Once again, thank you, Nescafe, for sponsoring this episode. Check out their new album with natural sounds coming from Nescafe Farms on music streaming platforms. Listen to the full audio version of this podcast on Spotify and Apple Podcasts.